Now we're going to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 21662 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out revisions to this week's business. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Oh. Thank you very much. No member has asked... Oh, sorry. Neil Finlay, do you wish to speak on this motion? No, I'm not asking. No member has asked to speak on the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 21662 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. We turn now to topical questions. Our first question this afternoon is from Alison Johnson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to regularly test all staff and residents in care homes for COVID-19. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Since the weekend of the 2nd and 3rd of May, enhanced outbreak investigations are carried out in care homes where there has been a confirmed case of COVID-19. In this instance, all residents and staff are offered testing whether they are symptomatic or not. The enhanced outbreak investigations also include other homes if that facility is part of a group or chain. There is also sample testing in care homes where there have been no cases as part of our surveillance work. All of this is, in, uh, is an advance on the position before where symptomatic residents were tested and from the 22nd of April, all admissions being tested with the exception of those instances where a person was being discharged from hospital to a care home, having been in hospital for the virus, in which case they would have given two negative tests before discharge. Alison Johnson. Thank you. The outbreak of COVID in a care home on Sky is having a tragic impact on residents and staff, and my heart goes out to all affected, and I commend the efforts being made by all caring for the residents. Professor Hugh Pennington in this Parliament last week said that the only way we can stop problems in care homes is to stop the virus getting into them in the first place, because once it gets into them, it's out of control. So the government's job now um, is, of course, to ensure everything is done to prevent further outbreaks. And there's no doubt that regular routine testing alongside adequate PPE is a key to achieve this. Imperial College published research concluding that weekly testing for at-risk workers like carers could reduce the spread of COVID from these individuals by a third. Can the minister confirm whether the Scottish Government accepts this conclusion, and if so, why they have yet to introduce regular testing, even though our daily capacity testing continues to fall well below the capacity that we have? Cabinet Secretary. So I would say that every uh, incidence in a care home is a tragic event. Of course, uh, members are particularly focused on Sky after this weekend, but we have had outbreaks elsewhere. And in this respect, at least uh, Professor Pennington is absolutely correct about the key being uh, twofold, actually. First, to stop the virus getting into a care home and then uh, to ensure that transmission routes are broken inside a care home. So that would be why, for example, on the 13th of March, we issued clinical guidance to all care homes, requiring them to uh, uh, ensure that residents were looked after in their own rooms, uh, that there was appropriate infection prevention and control. That is a requirement in any event of their care inspectorate registration and that we stepped in where there were difficulties and continue to do this to ensure the supply of proper PPE. Uh, in addition, of course, as members know, uh, uh, visits were uh, stopped to care homes as they were to hospitals. Uh, what I have to point out, though, is that unlike our NHS, our care homes have 70% private providers, uh, around about 20% independent providers, and around about 10% are local authority care homes. So our capacity to intervene directly and direct directly is limited, although we have undertaken much more of that through the instruction to uh, directors of public health to provide that additional clinical wraparound uh, for our care homes. And that work is underway and some of it may indeed appear in the emergency legislation yet to come to the parliament. In terms of regular testing, where uh, asymptomatic individuals are tested or where test results come back as negative, the accepted practice, though there is some debate around how often you would then continue testing, but broadly speaking, you would then test twice a week until 
you concluded that there was no point in continuing testing. From our point of view, we will continue to do that in those, with those care home residents and care home staff where the results are coming back negative, we will nonetheless continue to keep testing uh, so that should a positive result appear, we are alert to it straight away and not reliant on the care home advising us and therefore we can act in that regard. Alison Johnson. Thank you. We know that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people can be infectious and that's why regular routine testing is so important. The predominantly female, low-paid social care workforce deserve every protection we can give them. We're all aware of how these dedicated staff have gone above and beyond the call of duty throughout this crisis to support those they care for. Yet Unison tell us that this workforce are terrified of passing on the virus between patients. Regularly testing these workers would ease, it would ease anxiety, it would reduce the spread and it would prevent unnecessary isolation. Testing capacity continues to go unused every day. This week alone, thousands of tests that could have been taken up have gone unused. So why is the government so reluctant to address this issue? So I need to make two points. It's, it is correct, as Ms Johnson asserts, that we know that asymptomatic individuals do shed virus. What is not clear at this point is the level of virus, but we do know that they shed virus. What we didn't know at the start of this pandemic, about 130 to 140 days ago, is we did not know that. At that point, it was clear from the scientific advice that asymptomatic people did not shed virus. So the point I'm making, presiding officer, is that uh, our approach to how we handle this pandemic has to be uh, evolutionary as our understanding from the scientific and clinical advice we receive from our understanding of how the virus is progressing elsewhere in the world is evolutionary. So we understand more as we go, we change our strategy and our implementation of that as we go. So I am not ruling out the regular testing of health and social care staff if uh, the advice that we receive indicates that that is exactly the right thing we should do more than we are doing at the moment as we are now doing in care homes. In terms of Unison's position, of course, we discuss uh, through our leadership group uh, twice a week, I think, all the, with all the unions in health and social care, including the BMA and uh, the RCN, but Unison Unite GMB. Uh, I'm due to have a, a discussion with Unison this week, and I'm sure we'll pick up that point with them, I think, uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, like Alison Johnston, I'm deeply distressed for the residents and staff at Home Farm, Care Home and Sky. A constituent with a relative in the home has told me that she was raising concerns with senior management of the company about the lack of PPE for staff and she'd also raised concerns with them about temporary staff being taken in from other homes without a period of isolation. I have written to both the, I've written to the cabinet secretary and also put down a written question asking on behalf of another constituent for a protocol for care homes in this pandemic and I have had no response to that. When will there be a protocol available for care homes to prevent tragedies such as this one in Skye? Cabinet Secretary. So I'm assuming the first part of Ms Grant's question is the question that we were asked by, I think it was Sky News, um, just a couple of days ago, a situation we were unaware of because until today Ms Grant has not advised me of it. In terms of your other question, the answer to your PQ I think will be with you shortly. If I know the detail, if I know the detail of the constituent and the question that they raised, then I am happy to pursue that. In terms of a protocol, I'm not sure what you mean. The guidance to care homes is really clear. And that guidance is that residents should be looked after in their own rooms. There should be no communal socialising or meal times. That visits should be stopped and that there should be no transfer of staff from one care home to another because all of this is about breaking the transmission route. That I think is a protocol of type, but if there are other areas that Ms Grant wants us to add into that, then I'm very happy to consider those and include them. I would make the point though, uh, that I've made before, 
that many of the issues that members are raising are issues where private care home providers, where the majority of the outbreaks are, private care home providers have not, in some instances, appeared to follow the guidance that we require them to follow. And that is why, as a government, we are now taking a more direct intervention route in those cases. Rhoda Grant. Can I just come back to provide a little clarity? There are two separate constituents. One was a relative in Home Farm Care Home who has told me she has raised her concerns over and over again with the management of that home. And they have not been heard they have not dealt with that and her relative is very sick at the moment. I also wrote on behalf of another constituent about a protocol and I've been given a holding answer. Presiding officer, if there was no protocol available, why was I given a holding answer rather than an answer to that question requesting one? Cabinet Secretary. So on your, the question that you've asked the PQ about, you will have an answer to that. On the uh, question that your constituent has raised about the management in a particular care home and the concerns that they've raised, as I've said, if you tell me who that care home is, then I will intervene directly with that care home and get an answer to the questions that your constituent is rightly raising because the management should be dealing with those concerns. Thank you. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware of the particular circumstances facing Inverclyde with population decline, an older population which is growing. 15 care homes and after two sets of NRS data have been published, we now have on the unenviable figure of three times the level of COVID-19 deaths than any other part of Scotland. What additional actions and resources will the Cabinet Secretary introduce to help reduce the level of deaths in my constituency with a focus on care homes, particularly regarding the residents and their staff? Cabinet Secretary. So as I said uh, previously, directors of public health, that's NHS directors of public health, have now been given the authority to intervene directly in care homes in their locality. That is to ensure that primary care is directly engaged with all those care homes, to provide NHS staff uh, where the care home provider agrees to that, uh, in order to ensure that the right clinical uh, interventions are made in terms of helping care home staff who may want more in the way of training in terms of infection prevention and control to check the levels of PPE and that all the guidance from the 13th of March onwards is being followed. Now that is the case for all directors of public health with all of our territorial health boards they have all made contact with all 1,083 care homes in their area. They are paying particular attention to those care homes that have an active case and ensuring that the testing that I mentioned earlier is underway, if not completed. And they are in constant touch in those care homes. But they also need to pay attention to those care homes where there is not yet any active case because we need to, if you like, shield them and make very sure that they have everything in place to prevent an active case in as much as that is possible. If uh, there are additional measures that are required in Inverclyde or in any other area, then the directors of public health have the authority to introduce those. And I am happy to make specific uh, questions of the director concerned in Mr McMillan's constituency and ask him through me to provide uh, the additional information or the information to Mr uh, McMillan about exactly what they are doing with the care homes in the Inverclyde area. Thank you, Mike Rumbles, to be followed by Neil Findlay. Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand the reactive testing in our care homes, absolutely necessary. Uh, if I understood the Cabinet Secretary correctly, she did in her first answer talk about random sampling, I think. Uh, if that's the case and random sampling is taking place where there aren't yet hopefully any instances, has that, reduced, has that produced any positive cases from that random sampling? Cabinet Secretary. So, I, so Mr Rumbles is correct, where there are care homes with no active cases at this point, uh, testing is undertaken, providing the residents and the staff of course agree to that. Uh, so in that sense it is randomised because not everyone does agree to it. I don't have the direct information to answer his question about whether or not any positive cases have been uncovered as a consequence of that, but I'm happy to uh, uh, look out that information and provide it to Mr Rumbles. What I do know is that in instances 
where testing is underway and individuals have initially given a negative test, repeat testing has produced positive test results. In those instances where we're talking about staff, uh, there are two additional ways in which we can support care home providers. One is to ensure that NHS staff are then offered uh, to uh, where they are content with that, of course, uh, offered to supplement the staffing rotas in a care home. And of course, we have those uh, 2,200, 2,300 returners from our exercise in March and April, uh, all of whom have experience in social care. And already we have deployed some uh, and others are waiting uh, to be deployed to care homes where care homes ask for that to happen. Neil Finlay. President officer, I'm asking this question on behalf of families and care staff in my region who have contacted me about uh, cases that they have been involved in and I declare an interest as my mum is in a care home. Um, the system of testing from the outset has been one of the greatest failings of the strategy to address this crisis. So, Cabinet Secretary, can you tell me why so many, when so many non-COVID hospital wards are vastly underutilised, some empty at the moment, why we are sending elderly and vulnerable people from hospital to care homes, risking their well-being, the other residents' well-being and the staff well-being when their COVID status has not been determined? Cabinet Secretary. Well, two things I need to say is, first of all, our hospital occupancy is growing as the work that we have done to um, remind people that the NHS is open for uh, urgent care as well as for COVID care uh, is being successful. So the occupancy rate is growing. Secondly, we need to keep uh, a degree of unoccupied uh, capacity in our hospitals because we cannot yet be confident that we are past the highest number of COVID cases at this point. Um, uh, that our number that uh, I and the First Minister and others refer to is under one, but it is not sufficiently under one, and the results are fragile around that, for us to release too much of that capacity at this point, although that is one of the considerations in all the work that we are undertaking to see whether or not there can be any easement of the current lockdown restrictions. The second point I'd make is this, and that is that we all know that the longer a person stays in hospital when they no longer require the clinical treatment of that hospital, particularly if they are elderly, then uh, they become uh, less mobile, uh, less able, more open to other infections. And the situation that we have put in place for admissions to care homes is very clear. And that is that, that if it is possible, um, if the person has been in hospital for COVID, they would need to give two negative tests before discharge. If that has not been the case, then um, if it's possible for them to be tested before admission, that, that should happen. But otherwise, they should be uh, admitted to the care home, isolated for 14 days, but tested on admission. The test results come back uh, from our NHS labs between uh, 12 and 24 hours, so you would know very quickly whether the individual had COVID-19 or not. And if they did not have that, then the degree of isolation and barrier nursing around them could be lessened. I, I think that is, in, in standard terms, in well-proven terms, a, a way of protecting both the individual themselves, but also those uh, who are caring for them. And of course, they, like other residents, in a care home should not be mixing with each other in any respect. That was a critical part of the 13th of March guidance. Thank you. There are further questions to this, but we have to move on, I'm afraid. Question number two, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it's carried out of the impact of the lockdown on the mental and physical health of older people, in light of the views of the BME and Royal College of GPs that age alone should not determine social distancing rules. Minister Claire Hockey. The framework for decision making published on the 23rd of April 2020 is clear that the current lockdown measures are absolutely essential right now, but we acknowledge that they have damaging consequences of their own. 
physical and mental health, um, uh, consequences for our economy and for our living standards, um, including those of older people. And we recognise the challenges faced by many older people and have provided a range of support, such as the National Helpline and the £350 million funding package to help local authorities and voluntary organisations assist where required. Um, looking ahead, it's important that there are clear criteria to guide decisions on whether to maintain, tighten or relax the lockdown. And as a government, we will listen to the best scientific advice and to the people of Scotland as we make our judgments. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for her response. Does she accept that in many cases, older people are well placed to make their own judgments on how best to shield or distance themselves while maintaining a healthy balance in terms of mental health and combating loneliness. And other countries have ruled out legally enforcing age-based restrictions. As we make decisions on the next phase, can the Minister set out that the government's view is that age-based restrictions would be discriminatory? Claire Rocky. Um, I thank Monica Lennon for her supplementary question. I think we have to differentiate between shielding and the vulnerable groups who we are asking to um, adhere to the, the guidance that the general population is asked to, um, to adhere to in terms of um, washing their hands frequently, staying at home and not socialising with people outside your own household. Um, for the over 70s, we know that there is um, the, the research of this uh, disease so far that mortality does rise in that age group. Um, and that a large proportion of severe disease is in the over 70s, even when pre-existing conditions are taken into account. Um, although the risk is hard to quantify, we know that diseases that make you immunosuppressed, obesity, respiratory diseases all have worsened outcomes. Um, so we know that age does matter in, with this infection, and that's why we have taken the precautionary step to ask over 70s to be particularly careful with their physical distancing, with their hand washing and not mixing households. I appreciate this is a very difficult time for everyone and particularly for some of our older, older generations. My own parents are in that age group and they find it really difficult not being able to spend time with, with their children and with grandchildren. But this is about protecting lives, saving lives and keeping our NHS safe. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for that response. I think as we go into the next phase, people want to understand if these guidelines will be advisory or if they'll be legally enforceable. But if I can turn to uh, another related point, the Minister will be familiar with Seniors Together, uh, who represent older people in South Lanarkshire. Helen Biggins, who is the Chair, has told me that Seniors Together are concerned about elder abuse, which can be physical, mental or financial in nature. And she fears it could become much worse as older people are stuck behind closed doors. Can the Minister say what the Government is actively doing to protect and support older people who are feeling more vulnerable and alone as a result of lockdown and who would feel more confident if they could have contact with people that they trust? Minister. Okay, can I just put on record, as I'm sure Monica Lennon would, that elder abuse is, is, is not acceptable. And if, the, if anyone feels that they are vulnerable or that they have been experiencing abuse that is help there for them and that they should reach out to get that. Domestic violence and other abuse services are still available during lockdown. And I think it's really important that we get that message out there. I think we all have a responsibility to look after our communities. And we've seen right across South Lanarkshire and in my own constituency, some fantastic local community responses in terms of reaching out to your neighbours, in terms of supporting vulnerable people providing food packages, but also providing social support, listening ears and, and befriending services. So um, while we still have to uh, maintain uh, the or follow guidance in terms of maintaining social distancing, I think it's really important that we reach out to our own communities, our own friends and our own families to ensure that people do feel safe when they speak out. Thank you. Miles Briggs to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Miles Thank Briggs. you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Carers Scotland have warned that half of Scots carers face burnout as support services have been cut. Can I ask the Minister, when will the Scottish Government bring forward a plan for the safe return of respite care services? Minister. 
I can't give Mr Briggs a, a concrete answer to that. I would say to him that we will be reviewing all of the services to support carers. There, certainly, there are a lot of services that are there. They, have, they are now no longer face-to-face. -face. They're online or telephone support. And I think it's really important that people realise that those services are still there during lockdown. Um, as regards respite, we would need to look at the available evidence to the science round about how safe that would be to reintroduce that um, and to ensure that both the, the residents going into respite and those caring for them are going to be safe. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister if she can reiterate what additional support the Scottish Government is providing to key mental health services during the coronavirus pandemic to help people look after their mental health and wellbeing? Claire Hockey. So we recognise that there are a range of possible effects on people's mental health during this time. Some people may feel anxious, um, emotionally distressed, there might be escalating distress or, or mental ill health as, as a result of the pandemic, and that might be exacerbated by unemployment, financial uncertainty, isolation, bereavement, and many other reasons. Um, and we want to make sure that people identified as needing support can get those uh, services that are appropriate to their needs. We have developed guidance to help individuals to maintain good mental health through NHS Inform. We've ensured that NHS COVID-19 website carries advice on maintaining mental as well as physical health during the outbreak. And in addition to the expansion of NHS 24 already announced, we'll continue to explore extending and developing mental health and wellbeing services that people can access from home if they need to. Um, but it's, it's also important to know that we have mental health services working just now. So if people feel that they are becoming unwell, GP services, primary care services are there for them to access. And if they require referral on to a, a secondary care mental health service, then that facility is there. And in addition, we have, um, over the, the period of the, the last few weeks, we have opened uh, 17, I think it is, uh, mental health assessment centres across Scotland so that people don't access A&E for mental health assessments but are taken to a special facility where they can access those services more quickly. Alex Crow hamilton to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. One of the most difficult pieces of correspondence I get at the moment are from grandparents who are desperate to see their grandchildren, to see them and to hold them. Um, given that we are moving into an, uh, an era or a new phase of mass testing, does the, will the Minister consider introducing a scheme using a combination of testing and voluntary self-isolation, whereby family members might go and visit older relatives in self-isolation safely? And does she recognise that such a scheme would give much needed help to some of our older residents right now? Minister Claire Hockey. Thank Alex Cole Hamilton for that question. Um, I think we all recognise how difficult it is for all of us just now not being able to access uh, parents or grandparents. And it's particularly difficult for uh, people who are perhaps shielding or, or over 70 um, who can't access their grandchildren. It's heartbreaking. It is absolutely heartbreaking. I've heard tales of people who've had grandchildren born during lockdown and haven't been able to hold them as they normally would do or see them. So, you know, I have a, every sympathy for that. I think we're all going through a really difficult time not being able to hug our parents. Um, I think you, you've raised a really interesting um, proposition there. Um, I'm sure all of the, uh, the science uh, round about that will be explored. Um, I think we, we need to be very careful and very cautious in how we move forward. We have made a lot of gains in terms of reducing the spread of this virus and we need to be very careful not to lose those um, and we need to proceed with caution. And Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, uh, lockdown can only work if everyone accepts its parameters. David Blunkett, the former Home Secretary, is uh, uh, leading a petition to actually ensure that healthy older people are treated the same way as everyone else when lockdown ends. What is the incentive for someone in their late 70s who's in good health to actually uh, follow lockdown long after everyone else if they feel they only perhaps have a few years of life left and they want to make the most of it? Uh, surely these people should indeed be given the same consideration as any other healthy person of any age. Minister Clare Hockey. 
Um, I, uh, I think um, I, I need to refer Mr Gibson back to the answer that, a part of the answer that I gave to Monica Lennon earlier. We know that this age group are much more at risk. We know that they are that the mortality rate is higher within that group. We know that the measures that have been put in place currently are helping us to tackle this pandemic. We are we are all responsible for our, for our own actions, but I think we all need to follow the guidance, and the guidance is de, is led by the science. Um, so I I would caution anyone against going against that guidance. We all need to follow the government's guidance and socially isolate, stay at home, not mix with other households, wash your hands frequently. Thank you. Question number three, Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will pass on £155 million in Barnet consequentials to councils. Cabinet Secretary Kate Ford. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister has already made clear in this chamber, I am happy to confirm again that we will pass on those consequentials to local government in full. We took action quickly and have already committed to provide £175.6 million to local government. That includes £50 million hardship fund, a £45 million Scottish welfare fund top-up, £30 million for a food fund and £50 million for a council tax reduction scheme and social security top-up. That brings the total direct additional funding that we've committed to provide to local authorities to £330.6 million. COSLA agreed in a meeting with me over a fortnight ago that they would supply details on cost pressures and that information is still awaited. It's absolutely right that that information from councils informs distribution methodology to ensure that we support the areas of greatest need. Graeme Simpson. <clears throat> Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? That's actually the first time I've heard her um, agree to give all that £155 million to councils. She certainly didn't want to do that last week when I questioned her. But let's look at this uh, cost collection exercise that she's so keen to mention. Um, that cost collection exercise started um, at the start of April. Templates were sent to council finance officers on April the 6th. Now, that's 12 days before Robert Jenrick's windfall to uh, English councils was announced. So it's got absolutely nothing to do, nothing to do um, with the consequentials whatsoever. Can the Cabinet Secretary not accept that there is no link between the two and, and that uh, councils should just be given the money full stop? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's actually highly irresponsible to be allocating money without carrying out the necessary analysis to understand and determine where local authorities require it most. I agreed in perfectly good faith with COSLA over a fortnight ago that we would need to see uh, figures in terms of their additional pressures. I accept, I've accepted all along, that local government have done an exceptional job in the response to coronavirus. I also accept that there are cost pressures. But as the member will have seen, I too have seen individual councils identifying what their cost pressures are. There's a variety of need out there. And I think it's important that in any of these uh, spending decisions, we decide in consultation with COSLA. It's not for me to determine why that cost collection exercise has taken so long. I await it with interest. I look forward to receiving it, and I look forward to ensuring that local authorities get the funding that they need. Graeme Simpson. Well, as I've already said, the cost collection exercise has got nothing whatsoever to do with this 155 million, nothing. Um, it sounds to me like the Cabinet Secretary uh, is wanting to decide herself how that money is allocated. Um, so perhaps she can confirm that's the case. If it's not the case, uh, will she, as she should do, um, use the normal distribution model? And I hear I'm being heckled. Perhaps they want to listen to this. Use the normal distribution model that councils use, because failing to do that, uh, and I'm old enough to have seen this, uh, will lead to a war between councils and a battle within COSLA. We've seen it before, and she would do best to avoid that uh, and use the normal system rather than her deciding what each council should get. Cabinet Secretary. It is within the job description of the Cabinet Secretary for Finance to deliver a balanced budget and to allocate funding. In terms of the normal process that Graham Simpson has identified, that's for COSLA to inform and to influence. He has said that he wants to use the normal distribution methodology. That's 
his position to, to make that point. I'd rather hear from COSLA as to how they believe that that funding should be allocated. Annabel Ewan to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has set out how much additional funding is being provided to local government. I think she referred to the figure of £330.6 million. Pounds. Can she also outline what further uh, financial flexibilities the Scottish Government has provided to local authorities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in order to support local authorities to respond to coronavirus, we have agreed with COSLA to front load our weekly grant payments by £150 million in May, £100 million in June and £50 million in July, and to keep the cash flow position under review and make further adjustments if necessary. We've also increased the 2020-21 general revenue grant by £972 million and reduced business rates uh, support by the same amount, reflecting the potential loss of business rates income resulting for, from our support for businesses. Lastly, we've also provided additional flexibility linked to the previously ring-fenced uh, funding for early learning and childcare, pupil equity fund and challenge authorities and schools programme funding. And Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary said last week that local authorities should use their reserves while she decides how much support to provide them to enable them to deliver the new services and support our communities to cope with significant reductions in their incomes. In the previous answer, the Cabinet Secretary doesn't appear to get the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're not in a normal budget round. So don't, won't she accept why COSLA and our council colleagues are increasingly unhappy with the lack of support they've received to date? And isn't it just micromanaging? And aren't our councils equipped to carry out the necessary analysis to make the best use of these resources for our constituents across the whole of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. It's because we're in the middle of a pandemic that we moved quickly to begin with before there was these consequentials from the UK government to provide local authorities with funding. And I've already mentioned that 175.6 million pounds that we've provided to local authorities. But this appears to me as a storm in a teacup. My letter made clear that I was awaiting the confirmation of funding from local authorities in terms of their need. That was an agreed position with COSLA two weeks ago. I have committed once again, off the back of what the First Minister said a few weeks ago in this chamber, that we will pass on that funding in full. But I do believe that COSLA and local authorities should inform and influence how that money is allocated and not just members in this chamber. Thank you. Question number four, John McAlpine. Government, how soon it will begin to test asymptomatic people in the community as part of its test, trace, isolate and support strategy? Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, we are already testing asymptomatic people in care homes and those without typical COVID symptoms who are entering hospital and are over 70. This is in addition to ongoing surveillance studies in the community, which of course uh, do test people who uh, do not necessarily have COVID symptoms. When the test, trace, isolate support kicks in in full, it will complement some of the current testing work that is underway, but will not completely replace it. Uh, we still have specific focus on hospitals and care settings where there are particularly high risks. Uh, now and in the future, where we are testing asymptomatic individuals as part of our overall testing strategy and the test positive, uh, we will then apply the same trace, isolate and support approach to their contacts. Jim, Jim Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the paper published yesterday um, does say that it's uh, symptomatic people who will initially be tested. Now, the models that Test, Trace and Isolate is built on uh, come from studies in South Korea and Iceland in the Italian town of Vogue, where asymptomatic people tested positive. And in, in Vogue, um, it was 50 to 70 percent of people who tested positive. Given that research, some of which uh, came to the public attention in early March, would the Cabinet Secretary say what research exists that uh, suggests that asymptomatic people should not be tested? Cabinet Secretary. So, um, what the paper published yesterday actually says is that symptomatic individuals trigger trace and isolate. That means that 
uh, individuals that they have been in contact with who may not be symptomatic will be tested. They'll be traced and they'll be tested and if they test positive then they will be asked to isolate uh, whilst they wait for their test results and there will be support provided to them. So that is actually what the test, trait, isolate support approach says. Uh, my understanding from what I've read but also uh, what I hear from the group uh, chaired by Professor Andrew Morris is that that particular approach matches what the World Health Organization tells us should be the approach on test, trace, isolate. So it is a mix of symptomatic individuals and individuals with no symptoms, but have been in contact in some respect. And there are criteria about uh, what the levels of contact require to be in order to make uh, that strategy work most effectively. That is a central part of the work that we have already started. It, it was underway indeed in the home care uh, care home, home farm care home in uh, Skye over the weekend uh, was contact tracing and testing. Uh, so it's begun in some measure, but it will be ramped up as we look at the ways in which it, we can ease the current restrictions. But effectively, test, trait, isolate and support will be a strategy with us for some time to come. John McCarthy. Thank you. Um, the... Um the UK government is, uh, as we know, uh, trialling an, an app on the Isle of, of, of Wight, which it has designed uh, itself. Uh, does the Scottish government have any plans to go down the road of um, most other countries who are using the technology developed by Apple and Google, which is said to be more reliable and uh, less intrusive in terms of sharing information? Cabinet Secretary. So again, as uh, yesterday's uh, paper from government made clear, uh, our uh, core of our overall strategy relies primarily on individuals who will be the tracers uh, of contacts. Uh, that is because we believe that that is the most reliable way to take this forward. We think we will need around, our estimate is around 2,000 of those individuals. So that is essentially taking our current health protection teams in boards who undertake this work for other kinds of infections and expanding those considerably and the work to do that is underway. And that will be assisted by the use of digital technology. The digital technology that we are confident in using is the technology that is being developed by our own Digital Health and Care Institute attached to the University of Strathclyde. Uh, five years worth of track record, building on an app that already exists uh, and is used in Scotland to, ta to uh, trace, test and, or trace uh, contacts for other infectious diseases, primarily uh, sexually transmitted diseases. So that is being scaled up now uh, to be able to complement our strategy. In terms of the UK government's proximity app, uh, this is the one people will have seen in the media and I believe is being trialled in the Isle of Wight. Uh, we have not yet taken a view on that app and that is largely because we still await detailed technical information from the UK government about it, uh, assurance about the uh, security of data that it collects, the confidentiality of that data, and importantly, that what it uh, identifies fits into uh, the Scottish NHS system so that the data transfer uh, works well and that therefore allows us to see it as an enhancement to our strategy. Until we get all of that information, and we have been asking for it, I have a, another conversation later on today with Matt Hancock and colleagues from both Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, when we get that information, we'll be able to take a measured decision about whether we believe that particular proximity app will enhance our strategy or not. Brian Whittle to be followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. Just to follow on from uh, Joe McAlpine's question there on uh, the, the UK's testing of, of a, a, an app just now, I would ask, can I ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to the deployment of that app, and wouldn't it be uh, much more beneficial to have a, a, a cross UK uh, policy here uh, uh, that, uh, that, would, that would tackle this much, much better? And hi it highlights really the lack of technology available uh, currently, I think, in, in, the, uh, in the NHS across the board. Cabinet Secretary. So, 
so I think I've already answered that by and large. Once we have the information from uh, NHS England and NHS X, I think they're called, uh, on the technical information, but much more importantly, on the assurance about data confidentiality and security, and that the data that is gathered through that app, if people in Scotland uh, download it, feeds into our central approach in terms of test, trace and isolate, then we'll be able to take a view. But at this point, we can't take that view because we don't have that information. So if we're going to have a four-nation strategy on any of these matters, then we need to have the appropriate exchange of information so that all four nations can decide whether or not they want to go down a particular route. I think we've evidenced our willingness to do that so far. But, but we have also been really clear, as have my colleagues in Wales and Northern Ireland, that we take the right decisions for the, for the population for which we are directly responsible. In my case, that is the population of Scotland. Willie Rennie, to be followed by Rona Mackay. I am genuinely concerned about the prospect of confusion with having two different technology systems for different parts of the United Kingdom. And I just hope that the Minister is able to explain why we've got to this stage with the Minister lacking in the knowledge that she thinks she needs to have to give us the confidence that they're already testing in Isle of White, but we don't seem to know up here what that app involves. Can the Minister clear that up for us, please? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, it's very simple why I don't know that. The questions that we have been repeatedly asked have not yet been answered. So actually, that question is best directed to counterparts in the UK government. I continue to ask those questions. I continue, as do my officials, to hope for that information because I do want to make a decision about whether the proximity app is one that could enhance what we are already planning. But right at the moment, until I get my questions answered, I cannot ask, uh, make that decision. It's straightforward. I don't know why I've not had that information. Our questions are really clear. Uh, they're, answered, they're asked very politely. We've managed to get to some uh, joint places on other matters, but not yet on this. And I remain hopeful that we will do at some point. Thank you, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary expand on the importance of following the social distancing and personal hygiene measures set out by the Scottish Government as we move towards test, trace, isolate and support? Cabinet Secretary. So I, I'm grateful for the question because it is, a, it is a very important one. Whatever we do, including introducing or ramping up uh, our early start in test, trace, isolate and support strategy, including the uh, considerations the First Minister set out today, the way by which we go about uh, the consideration about how we might ease uh, any of the current restrictions and uh, what that may do in terms of our capacity uh, collectively across Scotland to suppress the virus and to control it. In all of those, um, social distancing, physical distancing, uh, in particular physical distancing and good hygiene will remain a central part of what we all need to do for some considerable time to come. And that is because we know um, the, we the means by which this virus is transmitted. So the physical distancing is there in order to try and prevent transmission and good hand hygiene as well as good respiratory hygiene is also there both to protect uh, ourselves as individuals but also to protect uh, those that we are with, including our family. The, the final point I'd make on this, presiding officer, is really important, and that's the difference that this whole exercise, this whole exercise is about population health. And what that means is that the decisions that I take as an individual, in this instance, the health decisions I take as an individual, doesn't only impact on me and my family, it also impacts on you, on everyone in this chamber. That is why we continue to say we need to do this together because our individual decisions have significant impacts for those around us. Thank you. Question number five, Alec Rowley. President officer, to ask the Scottish Government when recycling centres will be designated as essential services and reopened. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Presiding officer, local authorities are responsible for recycling centres and do need to consider several factors before reopening them. These include the ability to operate sites safely, ensuring physical distancing is maintained and discouraging the public from making unnecessary journeys. 
We are working closely with COSLA and local authorities on the development of a wider position statement regarding the prioritisation of waste services and are also discussing what further guidance and practical steps on recycling centres may be required. Uh, we are, of course, grateful to all of those working to maintain essential waste collection services across Scotland. Alan Rowley. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and um, I would concur that for those, particularly the refuse collection services and health and safety services that are being delivered across uh, Scotland, and we should thank all those frontline workers. I would have to say I had a discussion this morning with the co-leader of Fife Council, David Ross, who tells me that council officials in Fife have been talking with the police and have a proposal in place to at least start to try and open some of the recycling centres, given the levels they fly to them. Um, and he says that the, the stumbling block in trying to move forward with that is the Scottish Government. And the Scottish Government would have to be clear that these services are essential services and can be opened in a safe way. So, you know, there's no point in blaming local councils. We have a problem with flight to them. Will you work with councils? They want to get these centres open. Will you work with them to do so? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I think with the very best of respects to uh, Alec Rowley, I think that's exactly what I said we are currently um, doing. There are, as I'm aware, um, a number of local councils who are looking carefully at how they can manage this. It isn't just as straightforward, though, as a single council choosing to do so, because obviously there are impacts that can uh, begin to develop, as we see, I think, from uh, some of the actions that have happened south of the border. Uh, we don't want to see a replication of that here. It's very important that we understand how these recycling centres will, in fact, uh, be managed. Um, I have to say that... Uh, uh, one of the reasons why household waste recycling centres in Scotland were closed because, were, was because of workforce shortages. Um, average absence rates in waste services between 15 and 35 per cent, but some as high as 40 per cent. So some of that still has to be uh, worked through and managed. So it's not simply uh, a, a question of just saying, uh, yes, they can all be reopened. They have to be reopened safely. We have to know that it isn't going to uh, incentivise um, non-essential journeys. Um, and we have to, uh, have to make sure that they can be managed uh, as well as possible because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this is about minimising uh, the likelihood of continued uh, transfer of the virus. Alec Rowley. Uh, with the greatest respect to Rosina Cunningham, I would have to say that the, the first answer she gave was that councils were in charge of this and it was up to local authorities a second answer is that it's up to local authorities, but that you will not, as a government, give a blind just permission to, to open these centres. So there needs to be clarity. We need leadership. Councils are saying SEPA indeed. SEPA has reported a 40% increase in reports to fly tip in in April from April last year. So there is a problem here that needs to be addressed. Councils want to address that problem. They are working locally to put in place safe ways of doing so, and they want the Scottish Government to work with them and to agree to get these centres reopened. The sooner we can do that, the better, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will reflect on that. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm presuming the member doesn't want me to simply instruct all local authorities to reopen without regard to any other uh, matters. That would be utterly wrong, um, and I don't think it would solve any of the problems uh, um, uh, that would likely uh, transpire, and I'm pretty sure if I did that, he'd be the first here to tell me that I had no business instructing local authorities of anything of the sort. The fact is, we have to discuss with local authorities what guidance uh, is best going to allow them to manage uh, um, uh, recycling reopening, um, and make sure that there aren't unintended consequences from that, which the member doesn't seem to be particularly interested in. And he, mem he did talk about fly tipping. And, and can I just say, um, a number of the examples we've seen of fly tipping involve commercial waste that would normally be taken to a licensed disposal site. And that's not material that would normally be disposed of through local recycling centres. So opening recycling centres isn't necessarily going to fix that problem uh, either. So uh, I would caution the member just to be careful what it is he thinks he's calling for here uh, and to agree with us, as I said right at the outset, 
that we are having a proper conversation with COSLA about how this can best be managed for everybody's safety. Morris Golden to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Coronavirus restrictions have meant some councils have had to incinerate rather than recycle waste from both curbside as well as recycling centres. When will support and guidance be issued by the Scottish Government to help maintain recycling rates? Cabinet Secretary. Well, right now, what we are concerned about is to ensure that the waste collection service, the uh, uh, ability for us to manage this right across Scotland during this emergency is at the forefront of the conversations that we are having. Of course, uh, as we move forward, the continuing uh, necessity to recycle uh, is absolutely important. We're not uh, in any way wanting to take away from that. But right now, what we are trying to do is to manage a situation which isn't particularly easily managed, uh, given the, 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 the nature of what we're talking about. Um, and I hope that the member um, will agree with me that uh, uh, actually uh, conversation and collaboration and discussion and agreement is the very best way forward. Angus MacDonald. Thanks, uh, for saying So clearly local authorities across Scotland will be affected differently and at different times due to coronavirus. And it's paramount that uh, any waste management is carried out with the safety of the employees in mind. Uh, we all have a part to play here to reduce the spread of coronavirus and ultimately save lives. So can the Cabinet Secretary outline what guidance is available to households to help manage their household waste during coronavirus and where they can access more information? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we do, of course, agree that the well-being of workers is absolutely paramount. And we recognise the importance of supporting householders at this uh, rather difficult and awkward time. As part of these efforts and working in partnership with local government, we have launched a national communications campaign providing advice and support on arrangements for the management and collection of household waste. And the campaign website, managingourwaste.scot, provides householders with a range of guidance and received over 45,000 visits in its first week. Local authority websites continue to provide the very latest updates on local service changes. And I hope people uh, will access both local authority websites and the national campaign website, website uh, in order to uh, establish what best practice is in the current scenario. And James Kelly. Thank you, President Officer. The closure of the local recycling centre in Canvas Lang, where I live, has resulted in an increase in fly tipping and also uh, householders holding excess waste within their property. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what uh, routes exist for local communities to make their views known to councils and the government uh, on the, the safe reopening of these recycling centres? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think I probably did just answer that by reference to the council websites themselves, but I would anticipate that people have uh, regular discussion and uh, conversation with uh, local councillors, uh, with local council officials to uh, ensure that their views are heard and taken on board. Um, some recycling centres may be easier to open than other recycling centres for a variety of different reasons uh, from council area to council area. Um, and I think it is important that uh, um, the councils understand what the general impact on and uh, response from the public is uh, to both the closure that they've had to uh, endure, but also the potential for uh, reopening. Um, but I do want to remind everybody here that that point about the commercial waste fly tipping that is ongoing, that is not waste that would normally be going to these recycling centres. These recycling centres are household waste recycling centres, not commercial recycling centres. So, you know, there is, a, there, is a, there is a danger of assuming that all the fly tipping is household waste. That is not necessarily the case. Thank you very much. And on that note, we're going to conclude topical questions. And we're going to move on to the next item of business, which is a ministerial statement. Um, I would encourage all members who are leaving the chamber to do so uh, safely.